Well, greetings, the body of Christ, and welcome to Navigators on Monday the 24th of May, uh, where, of course, we're looking at the series Father God, the Great Initiator. So before we start, let's do as, as we always do. Let's go before the Lord and ask his blessing uh, upon our ears, our eyes, and our hearts today as we open up the Bible. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you rejoicing, Lord, knowing who we are in you. We thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus that cleansed us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, we also thank you for the precious Holy Spirit that you have imparted into us, along, Father God, with the instruction of the Spirit of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, Jesus Christ himself. Lord, as we open up your book, the Bible today, Father God, we thank you for the new Rhema and Logos that you have for us in your word today. And we give you thanks and praise for it now in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. Now, if you remember, we've been talking now quite extensively over the past few weeks about how we are in need of an intimate conversational connection and relationship with the Father through the Holy Spirit. And this is why we have said that this is where they, those of the Old Testament and we of the New Testament, need the guidance and teaching of the Holy Spirit who was sent to teach and lead us into an accurate understanding of the Word of God. Now turn with me, if you will, to 1 John 2, verse 27. 1 John 2, 27. The verse starts off with, But the wonderful anointing you have received from God is so much greater than their deception and now lives in you. There is no need for anyone to keep teaching you. His anointing teaches you all that you need to know, for it will lead you into truth, not a counterfeit. So just as the anointing has taught you, remain in Him remaining the Holy Spirit, we remain in Jesus Christ and the Father. After all, body of Christ, when we stand before the Lord, it won't be just what we've heard upon which we shall be judged, but upon, upon what we have accepted, believed, and acted upon. So again, the old adage re applies to know and not to do is really not yet to know. So, what the writer of Hebrews is doing is he's making a connection. This is in the book of Hebrews, of course. He's making a connection back to a time that was pollutant free, to that of our having those mixtures that are free of contaminants without being given a clean and clear inspiration of the image of the Father. Thus, taking the reader back to the place where the image of God can be seen and not just heard, with it being understood with a clarity, being free of man's pollutants. And what I mean by being free of man's pollutants is this, that of changing, man has changed and rewritten his story over that of God's story. Now, I'm going to try to introduce you to perhaps a new word, and maybe it's not a new word to you. And it's holytheistic. Holytheistic. Now, it saddens my heart greatly to see and to hear what I consider some of the greatest word preachers of our time who find it very difficult to explain the need for private jets that cost double-figured millions of dollars. One of whom, I'm sad to say, I respected as I began to learn about the word of faith well over 35 years ago. Now, as reported on camera, his inference was that he didn't now, I'm going to use his very own words as I quote, I don't want to get into a long tube that's full of demons. 
referring of course to a commercial flight. Now I personally find it heartbreaking and devastating to see that this consumption of wealth and privilege explained away so carelessly and callously being derogatory to the believers in the body of Christ of these two men, of whom one was asking his followers to pay for, or at least at best to help pay for a $54 million jet while parading on the wall behind him all of the jets he had previously owned. Now you can do a search for yourself by punching in to Google preachers defending their need for airplanes. Now it would seem, and this is where this new word comes in, that there is a holotheistic mentality that has entered into the church that can be nothing more than one of the pollutants that we are talking about and have been talking about. Now let's be frank. I never thought that I would see that the consumption of greed and hear these excuses for personal greed from these two men of God. One of which said, and I quote again, if Jesus were here today, he wouldn't be riding on a donkey. End of quote. No, he would be using these great amounts of money mentioned to feed and perhaps house the poor. Now, this isn't, of course, something new within the history of the church. We see this kind of pollutant many times within the Word of God, and there's basic, there basically isn't any excuse for it other than personal greed. There's so much polytheism and pantheism within the body of Christ today that bears a great resemblance and parallel to the Old Testament believers in their worship and acceptance of many gods. I think that we've come to a time today where we have to start being honest with ourselves and say, Lord, I want to breathe pure. I want to breathe clean. Now, please hear me when I say this. And that this is not to say that these two individuals haven't advanced the word of God with great strides in the last 40 years. But it seems to be a consistent failing of the men of God. We see the example of, the, of King David and King Solomon in the Old Testament. These are but two of the men of God who fall and fail in their human weaknesses. This is why I brought in Christ. Because we are told in the scriptures to guard our hearts with all diligence in Proverbs 4, 23 and 24. If you'd like to turn there with me, please. It starts off in verse 23 by reading, So above all, above all, guard the affections of your heart, for they affect all that you are. Pay attention to the welfare of your innermost being, your spirit, for from there flows the wellspring of life. Avoid dishonest speech and pretentious words. Be free from using perverse words no matter what. This means, of course, that as you breathe in the message, you can feel a little better. But alas, breathing in certain messages, you can also be breathing in a lot of misguiding instruction as well, questioning the authenticity of their hearts. We see then that the Gentiles were given the same kind of prescription, and we see that in Colossians 115 where we are told that he Jesus is the divine portrait the true likeness of the invisible God and the firstborn heir of all creation once again body of Christ we see here that the revelation of the father is discovered in the likeness of the son and that the son is the divine portrait of the Father and his character. Now Jesus, if you remember, said to Philip, if you want to see the Father, 
and know what he looks like, acts like, and talks like, then look to me. John 14, 8. He also said, for I am the Father all one. John 10, 30. But what we will find here in each reference is that there is a constant reflection. And that's not to say that there's a great difference between the Jesus of creation and the Jesus of Nazareth. But there is a different scenario in the, in the perception and the understanding when we say, say in a Bible study, with his being the same Jesus and the same Logos and the same Word, with there being no question about that. It is the same Jesus, the same Jesus in creation or Yahweh Elohim as he was known back then and Jesus in the New Testament. There is no difference. It's the same person. But we find in the environment within which we are hearing about Jesus is that we might find that we need to understand that there is enough spiritual pollution. There's enough spiritual pollution around that makes it difficult to see and to discern the Father even with the perfect image of the Father that Jesus presents. Because, because, within man's presentation, there is so much pollution surrounding the information that is coming in. And this is another of the critical reasons why we need the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit when we open up and study the Scriptures. Are we beginning to see how important it is to have an indwelling Holy Spirit teaching us from within, not an Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit, forgive me. One of the greatest stratagems of the enemy after his defeat of the cross of Calvary has been to create an atmosphere of pollution of the deadly fruit produced by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, blessing and calamity. Just enough so that there is a toxic environment within which we work in our quest for truth. So as we have said, that in the presentation of the gospel to the Gentiles, the prescription given to them was the same as that that was given to the Hebrews. Let's go back to Colossians 1, 15 through 17 again, where it tells us again, precept upon precept, he is the divine portrait the true likeness of the invisible God and the firstborn heir of all creation. For in him was created the universe of things, both in the heavenly realm and on the earth, all that is seen, all that is unseen, every seat of power, realm of government, principality and authority, it all exists through him and for his purpose. 17. He existed for before anything was made, and now everything finds completion in him. So it's very important, body of Christ, if we're to have any chance of a breakthrough of the pantheism that's, that, is, that we're drowning in and the fog of the, of the pollution that's descended upon the church, it's vitally important that we understand this. That, Jesus, that, that the Jesus that we're talking about and highlighting, that he, the very same Jesus of creation, who was with God in the beginning and was God, and being the very same Jesus that was born in Nazareth, or born in Bethlehem, forgive me, who lived up and grew up in Nazareth, and with his starting his early earthly ministry from there. We know that in Isaiah 41.10, it says, Fear not, for I am with you. And the Lord and the Holy Spirit, of course, are always with us, as is the Father. It's very important that we can make this connection between the Jesus of creation and the Jesus of Nazareth. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1 14. This is the very same Jesus who is known in the Hebrew as Yahweh Elohim that was with 
Elohim, God the Father, from the very beginning. Now it's also very important that we're able to see, we're able to see this, digest it, so that we can rid ourselves of the mild portrayal of Jesus that we were given while in children's church ministry. So the true image and the true character of God as seen by men is seen in its clarity at creation. At creation. If there's a difficulty in discerning the clarification of who the Father is, you can go back to the creation, back to the beginning, back to the foundations of the earth. And what will happen when you go back there is that you'll be able to see the fog of pantheism dissipating. And we'll truly begin to see what we should be seeing and looking at in the message of the gospel. Because the gospel, before it reaches our ears, has had to pass through many years of pantheism, polytheism, and the fog of spiritual pollution before it reached us. Now turn to Ephesians 3, if you would, and let's have a look at verses 1 through 4. Beloved friends, because of my love for Jesus Christ, I am now his prisoner for the sake of all of you who are not Jews, so that you will hear the gospel that God entrusted to me and that I share with you. For this wonderful mystery, which I briefly described, was given to me by divine revelation, so that whatever you read, so that whatever you read it, or wherever, whenever you read it, you will be able to understand my revelation and insight into the secret mystery of the Messiah. Now here we see Paul describing in great detail this truth as a mystery. It wasn't something discovered or uncovered by himself or anyone else. Indeed, it was revealed by God the Father when the time was right. Until then, it remained hidden for the long ages as generations of humanity came and went until the arrival of Jesus Christ, the Son of God in human form. What then do we know about John 1.1? 1, 1? Well, we know that in the beginning, the living expression was already there. Jesus Christ was already there, or Yahweh Elohim was already there. In the beginning was the Logos. And what have we discovered about the Logos in our studies? What we've discovered is that the Logos is the way that reality is structured. I hope you can grasp that, body of Christ. The Logos, Jesus, is the way that reality is structured. The Word is the way that reality is structured. So, in the beginning, the Logos is the way that reality was structured. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. And all things were made through him. Now forgive me, forgive the way I put this body of Christ, but to help us understand a little clearer, but when we read the word of God, when we read the word of God, we're actually reading the structure of God like a book using a colloquial term, which is an everyday expression. When we say about someone, oh, I can read them like a book. This is how open the Trinity is about our knowing their character, shape, and form. And the great joy of the mystery unveiled and revealed is that now in the heavenlies, there is one who has taken on human form and looks intentionally just like us. So what we have is this. In the beginning was the way that reality was structured once again. So we find ourselves in a time of questioning and discovering the rea reality of what eternity is. And, and for centuries now, since the birth of the church, We've had many theologians and historians 
telling us about the structure of reality and creation. And what we found, body of Christ, is that we are called, we are called, you and I are called to sort out the wheat from the chaff when it comes to man's explanation of the structure of reality. Now listen, the most important issue here at hand is that you yourself and I myself is that we must search out the structure of reality for ourselves. We must come to know Jesus ourselves in and on an intimate personal relationship and level. For what is most important is that when we stand before Christ, that we have that that we have done all that we can do to understand his nature and character and his being. For we now know, I hope, that as we study his nature and his character and his being, we ourselves, we are ourselves being transformed into his exact image. 2 Corinthians 3.18, if you would. 2 Corinthians 3.18 reads... We can all draw close to him with the veil removed, hallelujah, from our faces. And with no veil, we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are being transfigured. Now, in the middle of that verse, I just want to break it up. There is the Greek verb metamorpho. Used here, this word here, is the same word used for Jesus being transfigured on the mountain of transfiguration. So where it says we are all being transfigured, it's the same word metamorpho. We are being transfigured or metamorphosed into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another. And this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, the source of our transformation comes from Christ's glory. And the destination we are brought to is more glory. The transforming glory is the result of our gazing upon the beauty and the splendor of Jesus Christ. With no veil. So, in our investigating all of this, we have discovered the origins of ourselves and the universe. We have an opportunity to relocate ourselves from the smog and fog of pantheism and polytheism with the help of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Wisdom, who is Christ himself. Isaiah, if you would. Isaiah 11, 1 through 5. Listen to this, Bunny of Christ. We're going to bring the message to a close with this rendering here. The cut-off stump of Jesse will sprout and the fruitful branch will grow from his roots. The spirit of Yahweh will rest upon him, the spirit of extraordinary wisdom, the spirit of perfect understanding, the spirit of wise strategy, the spirit of mighty power, the spirit of revelation, and the spirit of the fear of Yahweh. Verse 3. He will find his delight in living by the spirit of the fear of the Lord. He will neither judge by appearance nor make his decisions based on rumors. With righteousness, he will uphold justice for the poor and defend the lonely of the earth. His words will be like a scepter of power that conquers the world and with his breath he will slay the lawless one. Verse 5. Righteousness will be his warrior sash and faithfulness his belt. Body of Christ, once again I fear for all of those who are gathering great fortunes of wealth unto themselves without giving great and thoughtful consideration to the fourth verse that we have just read. For those who are serving the Lord will find their delight in the Lord. For the Lord will uphold righteousness 
and applaud justice for the poor, defending the lowly of the earth. His words will be like a scepter of power that conquers the world. As, and as we see with his breath, he will slay the lawless one or the lawless ones. So we'll leave it here today, body of Christ. And I hope that we truly ponder all that we have discovered and read in today's word of God. I pray the Holy Spirit is ministering and speaking to each and every one of us about our commitment to the word and unto the Lord. So until next time, body of Christ, may the Lord God bless you. May the Lord God keep his keep you. May the Lord God's cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, your word today, Lord, has pierced our hearts. Lord, because you call to question our motives, our desires, our wants and our needs. And Lord, you've shown us that they should be pure. They should be directed and led and guided by the Holy Spirit as we go through this life, Lord, caring for the sick, for the poor and for the needy, and Lord, not amassing great wealth to ourselves. So we thank you and praise you for it, Father God. We thank you for the wisdom that you have instilled in us today. Lord, we thank you that the Holy Spirit has prepared a way for us to understand all of this and to correct any uh, diversions or faults that we may have in our own spirits as we give you praise and thanks for this Lord in all Jesus name in all things Father God in Jesus name we give you thanks amen and amen so body of Christ as always may I encourage you to walk with God to talk with God and be with God every day and every moment of your lives amen so shalom and God bless you and goodbye.